Hi there. Just want to talk a little bit about emotional resilience today and um, the emotional muscles and how we develop them, and particularly in relation to our children. Because I talk a bit, a little bit about this in my shows with regards to the giving and receiving thing, but about the fact that um, every time we give our children something to fill up a gap, every time we give them something to make their life easier, we've got to ask what have we taken away. And what I mean by that is what muscle isn't it getting a chance to have a workout so that it can grow strong? Like the emotional resilience, for example. You don't get resilience given to you at your 18th birthday and say, happy 18th birthday, there's resilience for the rest of your life. It's an emotional muscle that grows and develops. I believe we're born with it. But to keep it strong and healthy, it still needs a workout. Like our physical muscles need a workout. We need a workout. So if I was going to be a strong and resilient, then I would have to have situations for me to practice resilience so that I could work the muscle. If I was wanting to be more patient, then life would have to give me situations for me to practice being patient because that's how I work out the emotional muscle of patience. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? And so I think sometimes that with our children, we keep covering in the gaps to make their life easier for them, but we forget what we're taking away in doing that. And, and an example I often use in my shows that some people would have heard is around um, Jack and his car. Now, this is not a judgment about whether you should buy your kids their first car or whether your kids are going to be, you know, not turn out great just because you bought them their first car. It's not that. This is just a story and it's not a judgment of anybody else on what they do. Um, you feel like these days everything's got to come with a disclaimer. Anyway, so Jack knew that he had to buy his own car. That was just kind of what we decided. And that's not always easy when other kids, you know, having cars bought for them and your kids come home and go, oh, well, so and so's getting their car bought for them. Yeah, we're the worst family in the world. So, you know, you stay strong and, yep, you've got to buy your own car. So Jack got a part-time job at Domino's. Um, whatever amount of money he saved was what sort of car he was going to get. He didn't save a lot of money. So he didn't get a very good car. So anyway, he finds a car on carsales.com.au and he says, well, mum, let's go and have a look at it. What do I know about cars? I don't know anything about cars. So anyway, we take it for a dress drive. It goes. He goes, what do you think? I said, well, it goes. And he said, well, it is black and it's got a good sound system. I said, well, then let's get it. So it was a little Suzuki Swift. He called a tailor. <laughs> Sensing him my boy, Taylor Swift. So anyway, I drove Taylor home. Because he was still on his L's and had never driven a manual. So I drive Taylor home. And now this car would go on to give us many gaps for Jack to grow into and for me to grow into, I can tell you. And one in particular was I had just driven two hours to go to a legacy weekend with Thomas. So I had two hours in the car with autism along for the ride. So I was a bit stressed when I got there. And as I got there and got out of the car, the phone rang and it was Jack. I said, oh, hi, Jack. And he's now, you know, it's Friday afternoon. He's now driving himself to school. He's got his mate in the car. And he, I said, oh, hi, Jack. He goes, Mum, I've got a problem. I go, what? He goes, the car won't start. I'm outside the school and the car won't start again. And I go, oh, for God's sake. What do you mean it won't start? Well, I don't know. What do you, I don't know what to do. What, what do you want me to do about it, mate? I'm two hours away. I've just driven. You know I've gone away for the weekend. I've just driven two hours away. I can't do anything about it. Did you join our ACQ? Oh, you probably never around that, did you? Oh, no. no is Dan with you? What's your ring? His father. I don't know what I can do about it. What do you want, Jack? What do you want me to do? And Jack goes, well, I think you could just be a little bit more sympathetic for a start. And I go, oh, God's sake. I said, look, I've got to pee. I'll call you back. So I'm sitting there peeing and going, and this is what we do, isn't it? We go, oh, poor kid. This isn't fair. Hasn't got a father. Now he hasn't got a car. How many gaps does he need? The least that I could have done was buy him a car. Oh, then I'm feeling sad and I think, oh, I just better, I, I, look, I'll, I'll go and ring him. I'm feeling sympathetic now. So I go to ring him with my sympathetic voice on. And before I do, he rings me. So I answer the phone. I go, oh, Jack. He goes, mum, I'm a freaking legend. And I go, what? He goes, oh, flick the bonnet. Fill with a few wires. She's running like a dream. I swear I could see him doing this. So you see what happened there. With the gap of the problem with the car that comes with one of those kind of cars, well, with that gap, he grew into it. He fixed it himself. He sorted it out. Don't underestimate those little moments for emotional resilience building, for self-esteem building. Because he gets the ability to sort it out for himself. It means that he gets problems, he not get problem solving skills. He knows that he's got this. He can he can back himself. He can rely on himself. Don't underestimate all those little moments for nurturing and um, the emotional resilience and health of our children. So we don't have to fill up every gap for them. Every time we leave a gap, they get to grow into the gap and get stronger emotionally. So, um, yeah, don't beat yourself up over the gaps.